Hello, everyone. Uh, it's very weird to not be able to see everybody in the audience uh, unless I scan through all of your pictures. So hopefully you're there. Uh, and thanks for joining us. I hope you have also uh, got some info off the website where you can get a background. So next time uh, when you come, you can actually show your Swiss background so that you can show your pride uh, in uh, supporting the Swiss. Um, but happy to see some regulars that I know, uh, at least by name, and some other folks that I know by face to, in the audience. Um, we're going to be, uh, this is our first time doing this virtually, but we are planning to do this more. So we hope that you'll join us. Um, for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, uh, this is the Grit City Think and Drink. Uh, it's sponsored by uh, my boss, um, the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at UW Tacoma. Um, the Swiss Restaurant and Pub is a sponsor. Normally we are there. Um, this time we're trying to support their business so that they keep up and running. And so hopefully you placed your to-go order. I've got, I've got mine in the box. I already ate half of it. The rest of it's going to go down while the speaker's going. Um, so hopefully you supported them. Um, you also, by the way, can uh, donate to them and they're supplying meals to the folks working in the hospitals just up the hill from the Swiss. So I hope you'll uh, go and support them for that as well. And then uh, last sponsor is our multimedia production services. Uh, Mark here, who's the master behind the scenes, helping set this up. And they've been kind enough to donate their time to help run these community events for us uh, while we're doing it all virtually. So. A uh, big shout out to them as well. So glad you all are here. Um, and just so you know, we do this every Tuesday. Well, except for the last Tuesday of March, but or the second Tuesday of March. But we're going to do it the second Tuesday every month. Uh, and our speaker tonight, I'll introduce in just a second. But just wanted to give uh, a quick plug for the speakers that are coming uh, in the next round of things. So uh, Ruben Casas and uh, sorry, Anaid Yarena and a guest speaker coming from Brazil who's visiting right now in Tacoma, Flavia de Avia is gonna actually be there as well. So they're gonna talk about, um, all about uh, affordable housing and uh, how that plays in the social realm. So I hope you all come and check that out. It's definitely apropos right now. And that's on May 12th, the second Tuesday of May. And we've got the rest of the year planned out. So hopefully we will see you all there. Uh, so, uh, without, uh, so, and this case is going to be run a little bit different than we normally do. The prizes were given out when you picked up your order. So I don't know uh, any of you got lucky enough to get win either the Think and Drink socks or a copy of Watong's book or actually a gift certificate to the Swiss. Hopefully uh, you got a chance to do that. Maybe some lucky winners in the audience tonight. Um, you can actually uh, text me, I am uh, monitoring the chat. Um, so you can text me and let me know that you were a winner just so I know who to shout out to and congratulate you on your on your awesome winnings. Also, uh, so Tong's gonna give an awesome talk and then afterwards uh, we'll take some questions for her. So you're gonna chat those questions uh, down as the instructions say below. Uh, I will take those and I will feed them to our speaker and uh, she'll answer your questions. So that's how it's going to run tonight. So definitely be thinking about your questions. You can even text them in in advance if you want to, um, if they come to you, and we will um, take them as they come afterwards. And thank you so much for being here. So without further ado, I want to introduce, see if I can get there, introduce our speaker, um, Watong Sun is an associate professor of digital media and global design at the University of Washington. Oops, did that wrong. Sorry, co co covering my own stuff. The University of Washington Tacoma. She's an Oxford University Press author with two books, uh, and I have yet to get my first one out. So she's done cross-cultural technology design, and her newest one that she'll be talking about tonight, Global, global Social Media Design, just came out. The first book won a Best Technical Communication Book Award from the National Council of Teachers of English and received endorsements from Fast Company and User Experience Magazine. Um, she has offered invited lectures and design workshops at local practitioner meetings, international conferences, and leading universities in North America, Asia, and Europe. 
So I hope you will join me in welcoming Watong Sun and her talk. Thank you. Um, so I feel so honored to come to this session and be the first one to give uh, my talk on Zoom. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. I think I need to share screen first, then do PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. Wow. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank the Swiss the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, Multimedia Service and Advancement Office for organizing this talk. Um, I'm going to report a research project um, in this talk. So I would first um, start with this picture. Imagine we are meeting at the Swiss now, and you see my virtual background here, right? And uh, if you look at this, picture here and uh, we see this um, it's manifest is what the Swiss is and uh, we also see the port of Tacoma here right in the far distance um, so part of the Tacoma is one of the biggest container uh, um, port in North America as you can see I'm still adjusting my setting here so be a little pay, patient with me now. I think I'm adjusting my system well now. Okay, so every day when we come to campus, as we walk down from 19th Street, the port stays in the far distance here. Sometimes it's very hard to realize that the local is so global, but maybe not at this time. Particularly when the world is connected with the same healthcare challenges. So therefore, I'd like to use this local and global reality to begin my today's talk, that we see social media users fracture into tribes, but social media ecosystems are globally interconnected, technically, technically, socially, culturally, and economically. My talk will reveal how cultural practices locally and globally shapes the global competition of social messaging apps between WhatsApp we chat, line, and cacao talk. The talk will begin with a background session and then follow with three stories. So here's the background. Um, these are the four social messaging apps released on the Pacific Rim, um, listed according to that time of release from top of the bottom. How many apps can you recognize from this chart? Here's the answer. Um, the top one is the WhatsApp from United States released in November 2009. Second one, Kakao Talk from South Korea released in March 2010. WeChat from China uh, released in January 2011. And the Line from Japan released in June 2011. They have led the development of social network service globally since then. They are very similar in their technical calls, all combine the features of mobile text messaging service with social network service. All four of the social messaging apps have the following core features for messaging and chatting, like instant messaging, group chat, sharing contact information, location sharing, and customizing the chat interface wallpaper. So here's the 2013 interface of WhatsApp. Kakao Talk from South Korea. And you can see the one on the right is a customized interface with Kakao Friends. 
and the WeChat from China, and the Line from Japan. Also, you can see the customized interface with nine French characters. This is a newer interface of WhatsApp of the, the most recent I downloaded last year. Um, as we can compare the interface of WhatsApp over the year, one thing that really stands out from the comparison of these four social messaging apps is that what app simply focus on chatting function over the years. While the other three Asian apps do much more than that, so messaging is only a small part of the picture, and there are platforms for games, camera apps, multimedia, and more, such as paying bills, um, sending monetary gifts, calling taxis, ordering meals, and reading the published content. And they also present distinctive features characterized by local cultural and the technological conditions from where they originated. I chose to study these four apps for the following reasons. Because they originated from different cultural contexts, they represent culturally distinctive design features in contrast with other apps available at that time. They were the most popular social messaging app in their home countries at the time the study began. And they were leading the global competition with ad campaigns and the media coverage, while many others were only found in the app stores. And they are located in the Pacific Northwest region, where I have access to conduct cognitive field work. I began to track their development since late 2012, when all the three East Asian mobile apps entered the American market, aiming to be next Facebook globally. So here is an uh, infographic of 2013. Each of the social messaging apps has its own niches. So we can see WhatsApp thrives in Latin America and Europe and Hong Kong. WeChat led the Chinese market. Um, KakaoTalk dominated Korean market. And the line did this for the Japanese market. And uh, here's the data of 2017 when all the four apps were compared in the same chart released by Statista. We can see the change of the market share, right? So WhatsApp, WeChat, Line, and the Kakao Talk. Kakao Talk shrinked dramatically. Later, two of the four apps uh, reached the 1 billion daily active users mark. WhatsApp, sorry, WhatsApp reached this mark uh, in July 2017, and the WeChat did by the end of 2018. I conducted the multi-sided international field work in Japan, South Korea, China, United States, Germany between 2014 and 2017 in a few springs. Um, this research was approved by the Internal Review Board of the, the University of Washington, also sponsored by the Rauti Research Fund of UW and the uh, Research Development Fund School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences. So my goal was to uncover new relations and interactions surrounding global mobilities. The driving question is, how are mobilities culturally constituted, technologically mediated, and globally interconnected? Ultimately, I want my research to answer this question, how should we design and innovate um, a technology that is usable, meaningful, and empowering for local users at this stage of glo globalization. So field work consisted field visits, participant observation, and semi-structured interviews. Next, I'm going to report three stories after, out of this research. The first story is about global cultural flow with a focus on the nine application. So here are three field work pictures taken at this time of year, five years, five years ago in Seoul. Sometimes we just cannot imagine that how the research will take so long to develop 
you know, and evolve. So it was a shop of nine friends and a cafe and a store. It is located in Ganai, a high-end shopping district. Remember the song of Ghana style that was once very popular a few years ago? That was that particular Ghana, right? And the line, just to remind you, line is the most popular social messaging and social network app in Japan even now. So this is the most recent data released by Statista. Its user base, as you can see, almost doubles the user base of Twitter's and even more for Facebook's. So on the surface, when you look at this, these three pictures, it looks like a Japanese-based line opened a store in South Korea. However, actually, mine was developed by a local division of labor, so one of the largest internet companies in South Korea. Let's think about uh, Yahoo at peak time in the United States. Um, back then, back in 2011, because the company was dazzled by the instant success of Kakao Talk in South Korea. They decided to develop a line in Japan to avoid a head-to-head -head competition in the Korean market. But it turned out to be more successful years later. Remember this, right? Yeah. So what did they do to become so successful? Think about that. They also beat Twitter and Facebook in Japan. Um, this Korean company decided to connect with Japanese user fascination with the cartoon and anime, and they creatively branded the characters that made for their virtual stickers and the emoticons. Um, here we can see um, the most favorite couple of characters. This is Kony, a very emotional and a joyful rabbit, and a brown, a serious but sensitive bear. Both of them speak a lot to many of us from the bottom of our hearts, right? So these characters are not only incorporated as themed interfaces for users to download, but also expanded into new lines of line friends, accessory, cartoons, and the game to the offline world. Um, the release of these virtual stickers were regarded as a turning point for line, according to its CEO. And this Tokyo-based company opened many shops later called Line Friends Cafe and Store. I, you know, five years ago, when I was in front of the, this shop, I was shocked. You know, at that time, I was trying to understand what's happening. Are they doing this to reach out for um, offline users? But later, I found actually more than that. Yeah, so, um, so what they did, they opened a lot of line friend cafe and store in cosmopolitan areas of East Asia and North America, such as Tokyo, Seoul, Shanghai, New York City, Taiwan, Hong Kong, you know, to reach their user in person. As we can see, stores not only cast, carry a vast carry of these plush toys, um, t-shirts, cups, um, accessories, chargers, stationery, and also do cookies and coffees. And they, they sell coffee and snacks and provide studio space for selfies. Their value proposition was so successful that the company claimed their character as Asian number one character. In 2016, this is a screenshot of that time. We see the Line Friends website at that time. Two years later, they claimed this as global character brand. So Nine's connection with popular media culture went further than just selling push to plush toys and accessories. It was one of the first social messaging companies to use massive TV ad campaign to take on the overseas market. It had great success in India and Spain overtaking car talk in those markets back in 2013. Its product placement in one of the hot Korean TV series, My Love from Star, 
resulted a large number of international downloads. So you can see that the interface we see coding here. And the line characters also evolve with the trends of popular culture. A new series of eight line friend characters, BT21, was released in, in spring of 2018, featuring eight identities of the world famous South Korean boy band, BTS. If you haven't heard of BTS, ask for your younger friends. Yeah, BTS also participated in the design process. Inspired by the success of LINE, Kakao Talk also branded their virtual stickers as stick emoticons of Kakao Friends. Um, they released their Kakao Friends just shortly after LINE Friends. And the LINE Friends and Kakao Friends introduced a new mode of mobile communication beyond the text-based messages. And the people can have entire conversation only use, using these visual stickers. So on the right, the screenshots show that Gakatak emoticon enhanced communication for international long distance relationship. So for this particular female participant in South Korea, her favorite animated uh, stick emoticon are the brown dog Frodo, and then his girlfriend, the blue cat Neil. She used them a lot in her chat with her boyfriend back in Brazil. The lovely episode between Frodo and Leo touch her heart and help them to express feelings and maintain a long distance relationship. She even bought plush toys of the couple's favorite cacao friends. Compared with the line friend characters, um, we can see line characters express the communication subtleties of cosmopolitan grown-ups, while cacao friends characters look more exotic and imaginary according to some users. They're part of the growing kicked out uh, culture in South Korea, popular among adults ranging in age from their 20s to 40s, who enjoy a blending of culture of kid and adult. And uh, in the WeChat case, what changed is not just the way of communicating on social messaging platform, but also the way of paying bills. In Chinese culture, people like to send gift money in a wrapped packet to the older and the kids as an age-old social practice during holidays, like spring festival and on special occasions. So wrapped package of the lucky money as a way of mobile payment for WeChat transforms an age-old social practice into a new social ritual. As you can see on the right, and this particular feature was also promoted in the Times Square back in 2016. So on the platform of WeChat, right pack now serves as an icebreaker when newcomers join a group, or a token of appreciation when one asks for a favor from the group, such as you know, if you want to recruit people to do a survey for you. Um, in this way that, um, the, the user can send money to selected receivers. A user can toss a packet to a WeChat discussion group and turn this into a lottery game for multiple people by setting up the prize money. You can set up the identic random amount or identical amount. Yeah. Okay, the second story. I'm going to look at how global mobile identities are formed and mediated on those social messaging platforms. For today's talk, we'll only look at local data here, how WhatsApp helps the marginalized user population in the Great Seattle area to achieve that global mobilities. While most local users use Facebook Messenger and iMessage for messaging, need my field work show that Marginalized user groups use WhatsApp heavily because it helps for achieving participative agency. We'll look at two user cases here. There were the first generation college students whose parents immigrated to the United States as refugees decades ago. Before that, we'll first take a quick look at the business value of WhatsApp globally. Um, in case you don't know, um, WhatsApp is a Facebook company. More than six years ago, 
Facebook purchased WhatsApp for 19 billion. In comparison, Facebook only paid 1 billion for Instagram two years prior. So with that deal, Facebook is paying $42 per WhatsApp users. However, it has been considered a very good deal. Why? Why would Facebook spend so much for WhatsApp? Because Facebook was able to acquire half a million mobile numbers immediately, and most of the numbers are global, sorry, international numbers. Remember that they, they are very strong in the global market. And they got a unique username associated with those mobile numbers. And the Facebook are always able to know who, when, where, what, and why about these users' activities on WhatsApp. So they were able to gather data for their marketing platform, Facebook Insights. So in this case, I'm going to look at a 22-year-old Punjabi participant who was raised by illiterate parents along with his three sisters. They all received college education, including one doctorate degree for his oldest sister. This is a picture of him, his sister, and their dad. So as part of the marginalized group in the current American political and cultural climate, the group chat feature of WhatsApp enhanced group cohesiveness for his extended family in both the United States and Canada. He had three family chat groups on WhatsApp. So one for the big extended family. So we see that have 23 participants and the one for his immediate uh, family, but I didn't include the screenshot here. And the one for the younger people uh, in his extended family. Um, so we can see 18 participants here. He explained that respect is an important virtue for his ethnic group. In that regard, the group communication feature helped the participants to maintain the strong ties of the extended immigrant family across geographical region against a broad picture of global mobilities. The decision to use a certain messaging platform was also a community choice to sustain a culturally distinctive small religious community for agentive participation. Uh, the second case is a 21-year-old Chan Muslim participant. He indicated that WhatsApp was widely used among the younger people of his community. So he said WhatsApp has an easy way for group messaging. This is why we use a lot. So multiple groups were set up on WhatsApp to serve the community. For example, an aid gift exchange group was just launched before the interview to celebrate the end of the month long Ramadan fast. Yeah, this group. And such a community choice was not random. His community leader felt more comfortable with the information privacy that WhatsApp provided in comparison with Facebook Messenger, even though WhatsApp is also a Facebook company. <laughs> Though those two cases also show that for marginalized communities, while the study platform like WhatsApp helped mobilize them with group cohesiveness and the participative agency, they were also confined to their own corners, lacking effective message to get their voice out and further build coalition. Um, it's difficult to achieve group cohesively, cohesiveness in terms of a cultural sensitivity and coalition building in terms of cultural diversity at the same time, on top of all the difficulties of juggling between different language systems and the power structures. So from the technological infrastructure uh, aspect, using multiple messaging apps is a must. Today's social messaging apps and the mobile social network service are built with recommendation algorithms well, cultural difference have hardly any room. They form mobile cocooning, water gardens, and echo chambers. To stay within a community of culture 
or to reach out. One need to walk into those walled gardens. Participants also found these invisible walls. The Chan Muslim participant described his two friend circles bound by WhatsApp and a Facebook Messenger. On the one hand, he used WhatsApp to socialize with people from his ethnic community, getting involved with WhatsApp groups for religious services and for fun, such as playing computer games and doing YouTube production together. On the other hand, he used Facebook Messenger to work away school friends on school projects since everyone at his school has a Facebook account. So the social messaging project highlights a global design dilemma. How should the way a designers address the tension between cultural diversity and the cultural sensitivity as a part of today's global cultural diversity reality? To begin to answer this question, yeah, I, again, just to begin to answer this question, this is, not, this is such a dilemma, right? I'm going to wrap up today's talk with two UWT student projects. So I'm teaching a course called Cross-Cultural Communication Design. In my Cross-Cultural Communication Design course, we look at different cases of the global flow of cultural consumption and bring the, those insights to inform our design practices. Some of the cases we studied include Haichu, the candy Haichu, Hello Kitty, Nordic Walking, and the Instant Pot, and more. So the final project for this class is to localize and all redesign social messaging apps to bridge cultural differences. Um, the first student project was localizing Kakao Talk, thanks for a large Korean immigrant community in the local area. Through field work, students found that the emoji of Kakao Talk are too childlike for, the, for their local user in Tacoma. So they localized stickers to appeal to a much wider user population in the great Seattle region, and they made those virtual stickers more relatable. The second project, I'm going to look at um, another case. In this case, students designed a messaging app to facilitate learning of the luxury seat language of the Pulop tribe to help young tribe members to connect with other members of community and then revitalize the tribe culture. So one design feature they did is to use messaging to talk to an out member. These are beginning points, right? <laughs> um, so after hearing all the three stories, I hope today's talk will help you see our social media ecosystem are globally interconnected, technically, socially, culturally, and economically. Questions? Thank you very much, for Tong. Uh, Thank you. Give a, uh, a video a pause for her talk. Um, so if you have questions, please chat those. Um, the chat link is down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and you can click on that and type questions into me and I will feed them to our speaker if she doesn't see them. I have, while we're waiting for those, I have one to uh, lead you off with Watang. Okay. So you mentioned a kid adult culture, kid yes. adult culture. Yeah, I'm right, pretty right. sure I belong to that, but I didn't know <laughs> it was a thing. So is there okay. a kid adult culture in the US? This is a very good question. Um, I think maybe we can name it because also we talk about this as a global cultural flow. Yeah, so you can name it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it. I'm starting my own kid adult culture. Yeah. Uh, so somebody actually wrote in, can you talk more about the Lashotse language app? Um, how does that work and who's using it? Okay. Yeah, so thanks for asking this question. And um, unfortunately, I won't be able to give you much more details because this is a design prototype we did in class. And I like, really like this idea. And this project was done actually in 2016 and the students graduated 
and we were at that time we were talking about that we would like to make this into um, a real prototype, but to, yeah, we were not able to do that. But I see this type of projects as a chance to help students to think about what they can do with their um, design power. Yeah. So sorry, I'm not able to give you more detail. I hope this can be released in the future. <laughs> mm -hmm. So would this live within a particular kind of, uh, so is this in a, one of those particular apps that you were talking about? Yeah, so I think, so we, we were using um, the study of those social messaging apps to, in, to inform students. So I share um, my work, my field work with them. And uh, at that time, so that, think about that, was 2016 then uh, uh, we are looking at how cultural consumption help shift the design feature you know how we would like to um come up and help design culturally sustaining practices cultural practices yeah so when we're designing app we're not just thinking about the feature we're thinking about what kind of cultural sustaining practice would they like to um initiate or to sustain yeah the other folks remember to chat your questions i had another one for you so you know a lot of people talk about are worried about the surveillance culture in things like facebook and other things along those lines is that as big a deal in uh asian countries in korea and china where you've done this work or is it more less of a, a worry and people sort of buy into this more wholeheartedly um, so i think this is actually a complicated question um i took you guys to this um particular slide that i i thought that it was important to show you the business values of those mobile data and um as a matter of fact, that Facebook has built a very powerful social marketing platform called Facebook Insight. Then in comparison, I'm going back to China's situation or maybe Korea situation that um, I was able to talk with the designers um, of WeChat a few years ago, haven't been up, ha was not able to follow up with them later. But at that time, back in 2014, I was told that they, you know, I was told, just, I just want to put this. So um, they make money from games. So for WeChat, the, the host company is uh, Tencent, Tencent company. Actually, they made money from the, um, from games. So, um, they t so he t the designer told me that they don't necessarily to use data. So mm. that is the answer. But on the other hand, I also heard from other folks that um, the data need to be saved um, in certain server for half a year. So that's from my other channel. And um, another thing I would like to talk about that, that there are two versions of WeChat so the version we downloaded here in the United States is the international version. It's a different version from what you get from China. And the, the data are put in different servers. Yeah. Hmm. So what really worried me is not just about how the surveillance, is that the algorithm um, as a designer, as, the, as a design specialized in cross-cultural design and a cultural sustaining design. I'm concerned about the current recommendation algorithm um, putting people into the echo, echo ch chamber. Just think about that, what you watch on YouTube, that what you like will be sent to you all the time. And also think about that, you know, you must have got a lot of rumors about COVID-19 virus. And if you watched some videos on YouTube, you will keep getting the same, same type of messages. 
So that's a real concern that how we can come up with different um, algorithm that will address the tension between cultural diversity and the cultural sensitivity. Um, last year, when I was conducting um, field work in China last December, so one of the software uh, developers in China told me that, oh, he felt so frustrated because most of his work was trying to build a thickness of the app for his users. But he know that the, in building this kind of stickless, you know, so when we use stickless, we mean that um, people will be able to stay within that particular platform for a longer time. So they're using the same, the, some recommendation algorithm to keep people in the chamber, in the echo chamber and the, in the water gardens. Um, he felt very frustrated about it. I think this is a frustration may be shared by many software developers, not only in China, but also in other parts of the world. Yeah. Cool. I have another question from Ruben. He says, yeah. is there something specific about apps like Lime that fulfill communication needs among people on the move that helps explain their popularity among certain demographics, but not others, i.e. US-based users? Or how does Line meet the communication needs of diaspora in ways that Facebook Messenger or iMessages do not? Yeah, this is a very good question. Yeah, indeed that New York Times actually called these cultural sensitive apps uh, culture locally dominant messengers because we see these messengers are confined in certain cultural communities and in diaspora communities. So for example, that the Korean immigrants will use Kakao Talk and um, Chinese immigrants would use WeChat and uh, immigrants from Taiwan and uh, Japan would like to use um, Line. Yes, um, it's, it's both the cultural distinctive features and the community because other people are using that. Yeah, but gotcha. there are more than that. In the book, I actually talk about um, a case between WhatsApp and Telegram. So I didn't show people Telegram in today's slides, but Telegram, if people have um, the experience, Telegram is very similar to WhatsApp. The interface is very similar. And uh, I think one of the key features of Telegram is that it's private, so um, security feature. So they, they claim that um, they're doing very well um, for security. And uh, in my field of work in Germany, one of the participants who came from Spain told me that she, uh, sorry, he used both Telegram and uh, WhatsApp. And uh, actually the user community are the same, but they feel more connected with Telegram just because, for example, at that time, um, Telegram, because of Telegram security features, you know, just for that part. That uh, speaks why the people choose a particular messaging app. Even the feature looks very similar. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, I don't see any other more questions, but I have one last one for you. So if yeah. you're going to design a message, a app that we would use in Tacoma, what would be the features of it that would draw people to use it? This is a very good question. Um, I'm not going to answer this question. I asked my students to answer it. I feel that as I was a hoping teacher, to actually make designer. some money off of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll be happy to lead the projects um, as a teacher. Yeah. And uh, I think we can come up with quite a few interesting ideas. Yeah. But I, I think that uh, considering this type of project, we would like to um, 
do a more thorough, thorough um, field work to study our users. And I think students are the best advocate for their own needs. I assume that you are one targeting this these messaging up to students primarily. Of course, we also want to target to faculty, staff, right, and the community. I, I was actually thinking about Tacoma as at writ large, not just students and UW. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I missed that. <laughs> then, then we need to get more people involved. Yes. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Let's give another round of applause virtually to our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Watang. Uh, I want to give a, a thanks again to the Swiss for being the sponsor of this. Yes. And please, um, in between our Grit City Think and Drinks, make sure you place a takeout order and support them and the, uh, donate some money to give a meal up to the folks working in the hospital so hard. But thanks again to um, uh, Jack of the Swiss, who um, was game for trying to make this happen. And we will be doing this again on March 12th. So we hope that you will come and check out the talk at that point talking about um, affordable housing and it should be yes. really entertaining. So thank you all for turning in. Make sure you get the word out that we're doing this virtually now and we will see you all May 12th. May 12th it is, 6.30. Thank you folks, bye. Thank you.